Einstein developed two postulates upon which he based all of special relativity. His postulates replaced two fundamental problems or assumptions in 19th century physics. The first problem or assumption in prior physics was that there was such a thing as an absolute rest frame. This was referred to as the ether and all speeds in this model could be measured with respect to the ether. Einstein replaced that in which, with a theory that in which all th reference frames were considered equal and one could only judge relative velocities up from one frame to the next but could not, not judge an absolute velocity compared to an absolute rest frame. The other problem was Galilean relativity. Galilean relativity is essentially saying that there is an absolute time or a time which is used to coordinate all reference frames. And he replaced that theory with one in which time is a measurement tool and itself has to be understood in terms of a measurement process and using the speed of light. Einstein's new theory restarted the entire field of mechanics based on two very different postulates. The first postulate is that the speed of light for all observers in any reference frame will always be c. One doesn't need to, therefore, understand why it is so or how it's measured relative to an absolute rest frame. It's just taken as postulate that it will be c no matter how it's measured in any reference frame. The second postulate in Einstein's relativity is that the laws of physics will be the same in all reference frames. That is to say, there will be a force law, something like Newton's law F equals ma, and although the values might be different, the basic formulation of physics that momentum is conserved or energy is conserved would be agreed upon by any frame of observers in any frame of reference. In this section, we'll take a short consideration of what it means that the speed of light will be observed to be C, no matter who the reference frame is and who the observer is in that reference frame. And we'll look at some of the implications for that postulate. Postulate number one gives us a measurement tool for how we actually measure time in relativity. Suppose we sit here and we have a stopwatch. This is our measurement of time relative to where we are right now. And we're looking at some other event off in the, in the distance, maybe a pair a pair of cars crashing. Einstein's first postulate uses tool uh, uses light as a tool then to measure light uh, to measure time. To measure the time of a distant event, one uses our stopwatch near us and the propagation of light. Suppose I caught, saw a car crash off in the future or off in the excuse me in the distance. It might be a couple hundred yards away, and I can measure that using meter sticks. I can answer the time, or the question of what time did that car crash take place by using the propagation of light. I'll take the time of that event to be the time on my clock plus half the time required to send a light pulse from my hand down to that event which coincide, and whose arrival coincides with the event itself and then back, reflecting back to, toward me with the stopwatch. So we send a light pulse down, and because we know the speed of light and we agree for any observer that it's going to be C, we use the fact that there's a certain number of meters away and divide by the speed of light, and that gives us a time. Now, since we aren't out there where that remote event is, we have to measure the time of propagation down to the event and back and divide by 2. And once we know that the coordinates x, y, z of that, that event, and we know this time relative to our stopwatch, we can create a space-time coordinate which has all coordinates x, y, z, t for that distant event. Now, it's, it's an important point to talk about what we mean by simultaneous. In fact, it's somewhat confusing to think about why it is we have to talk about light propagating in the first place. After all, it's intuitive to us to sit here and think, I can measure when it was that a train passed right by me because I just say, I was sitting on a platform and I saw two simultaneous events, the ticking of a hand on my stopwatch and the arrival of the train on the platform. How come I can do that? And I, can't, I have to do this more elaborate procedure when I talk about the time of a distant event. Well, the difference is between that distant event and the one that's taking place on the on the platform 
is that I can judge what's simultaneous in my nearby proximity because we're at the same location, the train and the platform. So my judgment of simultaneity is not complicated by the fact that there's this finite time of propagation for light across distances. And once I talk about a distant location, in order to measure time for that distant location, at least as measured by me, I need to, to back into the calculation the time of propagation of light to that event. This brings up what is the key problem with Galilean relativity. If you remember, in Galilean relativity, we might have some coordinate system S, and it has some uh, three-dimensional uh, axes, x, y, and z. And now we suppose that we measure a particle's velocity in that coordinate system. It might have a velocity dr dt. But we'd like to know what is another observer that's moving relative to this system report for that velocity. So suppose there's another coordinate system, s prime, that's moving with velocity v with respect to s. In other words, it has its own coordinates, x prime, y prime, and z prime. And this set of axes is propagating, let's say, along the y direction with velocity v. In Galilean relativity, we say that these velocities add. In other words, dr dt prime is equal to dr dt, dr dt minus v. That comes about, actually, in a quite natural way because the description of coordinates x prime, y prime, and z prime can be written down in terms of that velocity difference between the two reference frames and time. So although y prime equals y and z prime equals z, x prime is equal to x minus vt. And when we take a derivative, then we get back the original equations dr prime dt equals dr dt minus v. The problem with this formulation is that both the relationship between the two coordinate systems uses the same time. In fact, it's kind of supposing that time is an abstract quantity or an absolute quantity that we could just know. And this is very much in contrast with Einstein's formulation where we say that time is a measurement tool and we actually have to evaluate time using the propagation of the speed of light. Galilean relativity or, or physics in the 19th century supposed that time was some absolutely knowable quantity, and that's just not true. Measuring time is actually kind of complicated. What we're really doing is making an evaluation of things that are simultaneous. When we judge that the train is passing by us on the platform at a station, we're making a judgment as to two events being simultaneous. It's the ticking of our stopwatch at a certain value and the passing of the train. Now that's okay because those two events are at the same location. There's no delay expected from the propagation of light. If we were to try to look at something that's far away, however, and remember that when we see, just because when we see it at a certain time on our stopwatch, we have to remember that we have to back out the propagation of light from that distant location to us. So now we have to remember that time is a measurement and the measurement tool is the propagation speed of the speed of light. Once we factor in that fact, this will generate some rather unexpected dynamics in how we formulate physics. In some sense, relativity is the first example of something we're going to see over and over again in this course, which is that sometimes we have to cast the laws of physics taking into account the, me the, the measurement process itself. We can't deal with abstractifications like an absolute time or an absolute rest frame. We have to actually look at real-world measurement processes in order to get the laws of physics right.